You are listening to episode number 66 of the Animals at Home podcast. Welcome back to the show. If you're new here, my name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you very much for joining us today. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting the importance of high-level, creative care, individualized for each animal. Well, I hope you are having a great fall so far. I always know it is officially fall when I have to fire up my humidifiers in my reptile room, and I had to do that about two weeks ago now, and they will run full-time from now till about you know, mid-May, late May, that's typically as long as I have to run them for. It's just another, you know, part of the weekly maintenance for me in the wintertime. I have really, really dry winters. I'm sure some of you do as well. I have several different humidifiers in this room just to keep it up. I I struggle to keep it at 40. That's always my goal in the winter. If I can keep the reptile room at 40, or 40% humidity, I'm doing a good job. The rest of my apartment drops down to eight or even sometimes 7% relative humidity because the heaters dry up the air so much. So anyway, that's what I'm dealing with. I'm also working on a very large, intricate project for my Brazilian rainbow bow. I'm kind of remaking that enclosure, just adding some different features and it is becoming a massive task and it's not anywhere near that's going to be, or I shouldn't say, it's not anywhere near being done, but it's definitely on its way. So I hope to have that video out in the next couple of weeks and I hope you guys enjoy it because I've been working hard on it and I don't want to say much more than that because I'm still working on a few things and I don't want to say anything that I don't end up doing. But anyway, very much looking forward to that. If you are enjoying the Animals at Home podcast, make sure you go to animalsathomenetwork.com. You will find all the show notes for every episode, including this episode on there, as well as links to all your favorite podcasting apps, including Apple, Spotify, Google, and Stitcher. And as always, if you are looking to support the show, there are three main ways you can easily do that. The first is pick yourself up an Animals at Home t-shirt. You can do that at animalsathome.ca slash shop. $5 does automatically get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Or you can go to the Apple Podcasting app and give the show a five-star rating and a review. That really does help our visibility in the podcasting app. And then the third thing you can do is just share. Share with your friends and your family on Facebook and Instagram. That is always a huge help. Make sure you tag me in it when you share so I can thank you personally. Thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for any reptile-related equipment, definitely go check them out. You can find links in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. Again, that is an affiliate link, which means if you do purchase something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that helps support the show. All right, let's jump into today's episode. So today I'm speaking with Ash Norman, who is a really interesting keeper. He has his hands in several different areas of the reptile keeping trade, which gives him a very unique perspective. So that made for just a great foundation for a conversation. Ash is the owner of Exotic of the World LTD, which is a reptile store in the small city of Grimsby in the UK. He actually opened that store when he was only 25 years old, which was an interesting story in itself. And of course, we get into that. Ash is also the instructor at a college in Grimsby, and every time I hear about these colleges in the UK, I get supremely jealous. We don't have anything quite like these hands-on animal management courses that I keep hearing about in the UK, and I'm super jealous. Ash is an instructor at one of these colleges, and he teaches a bunch of courses including exotics and the pet trade, exotics health and welfare, exotics husbandry and handling, and he's even had you know projects of students working on bioactive vivs and whatnot and watching YouTube videos to learn how to do it, like watching Serpa Design and whatnot, and we talk about that in the podcast, and I'm super jealous. So of course we discuss that. We also discuss what it's like to own a store and educate customers who come in with this sort of pet tube education, meaning they just, you know, the very basics, you don't need UV, you can do paper towel substrate and whatnot. That's what they see on YouTube. They come into a pet store and they're expecting to spend $100, but in reality, they should spend $300. What it's like to be a pet store owner when you're trying to educate customers that way. And there's a bunch of other really fascinating projects, including a project that he calls Project Thunder, where he's working in this store trying to create thunderstorms in certain enclosures. And and there's a, a breeding operation where he's trying to add UV into these rack systems. I don't want to say too much. Let's jump right into it. One thing I will say quick is for the first half of the podcast, Ash's voice does go through a little bit of sort of roboticness every once in a while. It's not consistent. It just comes in and out. But that does completely clear up through the second half of the podcast. The second half of the podcast is crystal clear. That's just the joys of recording over the internet from across an ocean. And of course, that just happens sometimes. So it's not super distracting. But if you're wondering what that is, it does go away. And the rest of the podcast is nice and clear. Let's jump into today's episode. I will talk to you once we're done. Enjoy. All right. Well, Ash, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. 
Thank you for having me. <laughs> you are one of those guys that has, uh, for one, you're a listener of the podcast, and we started chatting through that, and you also have your hands in several different pots in the animal and reptile world, so I think we can learn a lot from somebody like you. As we started talking, you started telling me all these different things that you're involved in. I thought, wow, we should just get you on the show, and you can share some of that information. Have reptiles always been something that you've been into from a young child, or did it, that happen later on in life? Um, no. So I've been keeping reptiles, um, since I was literally about 10 years old. I think it was like, um, the Christmas I was 10 when I got my first, uh, two bearded dragons, uh, that were kept together, <laughs> which is kind of gross now. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then it just kind of, it coasted along from there. Like there wasn't like a, um, like a super interest in it like I have now. Um, it was only really when I did work experience um, in year 10. So I would have been 14, I think, so about four years later. So I had my babies for four years and then I did my work experience uh, at the college I teach at now. Um, and they had like the biggest array of reptiles that I'd ever seen at that point, apart from a zoo, which like looking back now, um, it was actually a fairly small collection. <laughs> uh, but, but nevertheless, I was like amazed. I was like, Oh my God, like this is like really, really, really cool. Um, and then I just started to do like a little bit more like research into it. Um, and then started to, um, from the, I was asking my mum, oh, can I have this? No. Oh, can I have that? No. I was like, right, what can I do? I can't legally buy these animals because I'm not 16 yet. So because I find it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission yes. anyway, uh, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot easier. Um, so I was like, right. So even at like 14, I was like, I looked at like legislation and stuff. And it was like, okay, so I can't buy anything with a spine until I'm 16 what can I buy? And then it was like, oh my God, tarantulas and scorpions and like all oh, these like invertebrates and stuff. Uh, and then I basically kept a load of um, arachnids and like, other inverts and stuff like underneath my bed. Um, and then- And your mom, yeah. your mom didn't know? And then my mom like found out. She didn't know at first? No, no. Oh my gosh. Tell me about the story no. when she found out. No, did not know. Um, well, my mum is a massive arachnophobe anyway. Um, <laughs> she only found out when I had got the shop and then I moved all my collection there. So I, I opened the shop when I was 20. So six years I had like all these different species like underneath my bed and she was literally none the wiser. Um, and then I was like, oh yeah. She was like, where have you got all these like tarantulas and stuff from? I was like, they've been in our house mum for like ages for like six years and she was just like what and like went absolutely nuts at me like she was uh she was not best pleased that i was like but you didn't know like <laughs> that's amazing like you, you had no yeah you had no inkling whatsoever so yeah and then from there um i had like the odd like reptile like in between that was like dumped on me so predominantly it was like bearded dragons so i had like um, three, four B twos going across, and then it was another four high, so four eight twelve. So I had twelve four B twos in my bedroom, um, and I had all sorts of stuff like bearded dragons, like rescued stuff that I'd like make better and then like give to people because there was no feasible way I could like keep them all properly. So I just like make them better, do my best with the research that was available at the time, and then. Um, and then obviously go from there really. Um, and then it was only really at college when, um, so when I was 16 to 18, um, when my passion really took off and I was like, this is what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do with reptiles, but I know I want to work with them. Um, but it's not just reptiles now. It's like a plethora of, um, crazy kooky, like weird stuff. Like I feel like when you say reptiles, 
reptiles is like a branch term. So it doesn't just mean like lizards and snakes and stuff, but it also means like frogs and inverts, even though obviously they're completely separate taxa. Like when you say that, they're like, oh, okay, so you must keep X, Y, and Z as well. And it's like, yeah, like most people that I know anyway, they keep reptiles have like the odd invert or the odd amphibian, that type of thing. So yeah, it is very much an yeah. umbrella term. And then, yeah, 100%. Um, and then, yeah, and then we're here um, today. So I opened my shop when I was 20 years old. Um, and then last year, sorry, no, this year I started um, teaching um, at the college. But when I was 21, we did open the shop. We take on like work experiences and stuff like that. Um and I felt it was really important that we don't just use the work experiences as like a form of slave labor, which quite a lot of places do. They're just like, oh, clean this, do that. I mean, don't get me wrong, like cleaning is like a really big part of the animal care industry. Like these animals can't clean after themselves, so we have to do it. But I thought it was important that these kids also got taught um, appropriate terminology that we use for things like the binomial names um, for animals, like especially the ones that are in like university and stuff, like it's, it's really important. So we do things like quizzes with them um, and we have like a few spare tanks and we're like, right, okay, your animal is a crested gecko, for example, um, design a crested gecko enclosure and then they would go take the stock off the shelves and then I would get them to explain to me why they've chosen what they've chosen. And if they've done something wrong, then I'd be like, okay, well, this is where you've done wrong because of X, Y, and Z. So, yeah. So <laughs> That's very cool. So, yeah. So, Actually, one one thing I wanted to step back to really quick was I, I, I didn't realize that it was actually a law in the UK that you had to be 16 in order to buy a vertebrate pet. I've never heard that before. Is that is that something that's right through England? Uh, yeah, it's uh, th right through England, Scotland, uh, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, it was, I think it came into effect in the 1952 oh, wow. Pet Shop License Act or something like that. Um, it was, I'm pretty sure it was in the fifties. I mean, I'm pretty sure if I'm wrong, someone will correct me, but I've got that amount of legislation like banging around my head. <laughs> like it's, uh, sometimes uh, a bit confusing to get the, uh, dates bang on. So, but yeah, so you have to be 16, uh, to buy them. So, so yeah. tell me about how the, the, when you opened the pet shop, because you kind of went from, you said the sort of the casual keeper when you were 10 and 12 and then you became obsessed with the hobby, but then opening a shop at 20 is still really, really young to open a, a pet shop. So tell me about that endeavor. What was that like? Because opening a business is, doesn't matter what the business is, that's complicated. Yeah. Um, so when I was at college, my friend owned a uh, reptile shop um, and I worked there just as to like help out for the start. And then like I fell in love with it. Um, so it, it just keeps like coming back to me, like the whole education type thing. I like educating people, um, excuse me, um, on these animals. Um, so I did that for about two years and then whilst I was at, um, college and then university and then, um, I dropped out of uni lol, uh, to open the shop at 20 because one, the course that, um, I was on was something that was promised to me that wasn't what it actually was. So I was told that there was quite a lot of modules uh, like on exotics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there wasn't, there was just one module and it was exotics in the pet trade. And it just solely focused on how bad it actually is. Um, which of course, like it, it, it can be like it, there's, there's no, clean way of like doing these types of things like with animals and stuff. Um, but yeah, and I was like, do you know what? Like I'm not really a massive fan. I'm not really enjoying the course. Um, the shop that I was working at as well, um, I was getting a bit annoyed with the welfare standards. Um, so the welfare standards were absolutely atrocious. Um, all the animals had within um, their enclosures was just a basking spot ball on a dimming stat and that was it. So they had no access to UVB. Uh, they were all on um, beach chips, um, like little wood chip type things. Um, I'd supplied with one hide, one food bowl, one water bowl and that was it. 
So like the enclosures were like extremely, extremely sterile. And um, even at 17, like I was, I was thinking like, do you know what? This doesn't sit quite well with me. Like I'm not a massive fan. Like we had two tanks where animals were exposed to UV and it was kind of like a thing like, okay, so these animals are doing a lot better in this enclosure. Whereas these animals are doing really, really poorly. Like they're not eating, they're not growing at the same rates. Um, their sheds um, are really poor, um, everything um, like that. And even back then I was like, okay, so there has to be some sort of link because the only thing that was different was that they were supplied with this UV, uh, this UV tube. Even it was, I think it was like an exo tarot one. So it wasn't even that great. Like it wasn't like the big boys like Arcadia or like reptile systems or something like that. It was just something extremely basic. Um, so yeah. And then I just did some more research into it. Um, I started following, um, like John Courtney Smith. Um, so he wrote the guide to the elimination of, uh, MBD, um, in captivity. I read that book, uh, and I took it to the Don Castor Reptile Show and he signed it for me. So I was quite happy with that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, there's always been that kind of, like work with animals, education type thing, doing a bit of research. Like uh, I quite like science. So, but from that jump to um, going from the casual hobbyist to opening up a business, um, it was, I don't know. It just felt like it was the next step in a way. So I thought, okay, so realistically, I want to work with animals. I want to work with reptiles uh, specifically. What can I do in Grimsby, which is where I'm from, which is like a really tiny, tiny, tiny town, um, where there's not much going in the works of like the, of working with animals. Um, so I made my own niche. Um, there have been shops and stuff in the past that have sold reptiles, um, but their welfare standards don't meet mine and me ethically either. So it was kind of like from like a moral perspective as well. Um, like, okay, so I need to do this so I can improve or help improve the animals' lives in around the town. Um, so there was a few different factors really contributing to me actually doing this. Um, but it only really came about when I was on a night out once. Like I was had a few drinks and uh, my mate was just like, why don't you just open up a shop? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and I did. So there we are. <laughs> hey, that's how lots of businesses start, I think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was really fun. It was it was really difficult. Um, I mean, there have been really difficult periods like of the business. So we'll be five years old in um, October. Well, the shop actually opened in uh, in October, but we got the keys in like the summertime because uh, it was literally just a shell. Like it was like so bare. So we had to do like everything. And like when I look back at pictures from when we first opened to like now, I'm just like, oh my God, why did people even shop here? Like it just was so bare. There was like literally like nothing. But, um, but yeah, I, I love my customers like to bits. Like for, for the most part, like literally like 90 to 95% of them are absolutely Bob on like they're just fantastic well i think people pick up on the the you know the the genuine philosophy and the a animal welfare that you would have so even if the sh if if the store looks sort of bare i think they're happy to see the animals in good condition so maybe you could just paint a, a sort of a picture of what the store is like now what it's what it's called and sort of the species you guys sell and just in general what the store looks like uh so it's called uh exotics of the world uh limited um, so at the front of the shop is like all like the dry goods, um, and stuff like that. So, um, like obviously like UV bulbs, basking spot bulbs, substrates. Uh, there's also like information like we do like little information booklets and cards on like, um, on loose substrates. Um, cause I think as you probably know, a lot of people are like no loose substrates. And I'm just like, Hey, stop that like <laughs> no <laughs> yeah. you're you're straw manning an argument there yeah. um so yeah and then it's the till uh, and then as you go down is like the animal section so on the right hand side is where we keep all of our arid stuff 
so uh, that are in like the like wooden bibs and stuff like that. And then on the left hand side, uh, we call it the rainforest wall, uh, and it's all bioactive, like all one side. And it's about thirty six tanks um, on that side that are all they've all got like plants in them, and they've all got jungle dawn uh, LED bars, uh, UVB uh, miskin systems. Um, and yeah, we're up, to be fair, we're up, we've, we've been in the process of um, uh, for about two years. We've got a project called Project Thunder, uh, and on four of the tanks, uh, we're trying to mimic uh, thunderstorms and stuff. Um, so we've got uh, PC desktop fans um, in there. Um, we've got a Raspberry Pi that's connected to LED um, and base as well. Um, so we're just like testing it out um, at the moment. So especially for like frogs and stuff, because frog, I think a lot of frogs are quite dependent on um, like thunderstorms and stuff like that. I know like uh, Phylobartis and Dendrobartis, um, they're quite dependent on storms. And wow, stuff. So that's, so, that sounds yeah. really cool. So you basically have, uh, is, is it time so the, the, the lights flicker and then you have a bunch of the Miss King or something comes on and, and soaks the tank? Or, or how does that, what are you doing to mimic a thunderstorm? Yeah. Yeah, so um, what we've got, so we've got the Raspberry Pi, which is like a little mini like computer type thing, um, and that's connected to desktop fans, a separate misting system. Um, it's connected to a bass speaker. It's connected to a normal speaker that plays like rainforest sounds and stuff like that, um, and it will mimic the sound of rain um, as well and like the gushing like of the winds and stuff um so we've not quite perfected it yet because once we tweak with one thing like another thing just like goes out the window and it just like sets it all off and it's like oh my god like but we've been two years trying to like perfect this um so it's called project thunder that's what we call it yeah that's amazing so, i love yeah. stuff like and that. It, and it, yeah so it, it, we, we try to my like ethos like for the shop was just like the animals come first like they don't they haven't asked to be in the position that they're in i know it's kind of like a really like liberal like lefty like way of like thinking and stuff like that but um i feel personally responsible that the animals come into my shop uh they come in healthy they're healthy and happy and happy while they're with me and then when they leave they can carry on leaving leading sorry uh ready for food um for food lives um I mean, we're in the process as well of doing um, a breeding room um, as well. So, and that's just caused like a massive storm, a storm and a half. So, um, obviously, we're going to be using like the uh, racking like system. Um, but instead of just going for like tiny, like little tubs with like nothing in there, it's all in darkness, we've gone like a little bit bigger. Um, we're also supplying the animals with UVB, um, loose substrates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, when they, especially for when the females, they do have the eggs, they can recuperate a lot quicker. Um, and we're going to do it like every two seasons, so they can have like two years or so to just like calm down, chill out, recuperate that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're doing it with that in mind. So it, it was really difficult, though, to be fair, because. Um, if I had my way, everything would be like in like the appropriate housing, like even for a Leo, just like a four foot viv or something like that. So it's nice and chill. But obviously we've got to think about space and cost and whatnot. And it's the first time where like cost and uh, welfare have kind of been on like an even keel. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really difficult for me. Again, this breeding room has been in process for about a year because I, it, I can't sleep at night. <laughs> like I was like, oh, this is horrible. But it is what it is. As long as, as long as we can, as long as we can supply them with like the enrichment um, and the things they need to make them healthy and keep them healthy, then in my opinion, then that's okay. It'll it'll pass. Yeah, exactly. And I opinion. totally agree. And I, I I totally on the same page with your sentiment is we are 100 percent responsible for these animals and they didn't choose to be here. So as it is an obligation of us as the keeper to do the best job we can. And I, you, you guys should, I don't know if you do, but if you should have a YouTube channel for the shop because that sounds like an incredible project to document. I think showing people that you can use a racking system but still add enrichment and UVB would be really, really beneficial. I don't know if you've ever considered doing that or if you have that right now, but you should do it. Um, it has been spoken about um, in the past, but it's... Um 
it's really difficult, uh, to be fair, um, trying to get people into actually buying UVB, like with the snakes and with the leopard geckos and stuff, because you've got people like, for example, like Brian Barczyk, um, sorry, um, just, where all these bothers, cool paint jobs, dude, cool paint jobs. Yeah. Like, and it's yeah. like, just because an animal is like polymorphic doesn't mean just like you can like do what you're doing to it. Like we know what we've done with dogs. So like bugs, for example, and other brachiocephalic breeds, we know these things that we're doing to them are not great. So why would we try and recreate that just so we can get a weird looking animal? I, I, I personally, I, I don't really agree with it. Um, in, in my opinion, um, to be fair, but, but yeah, anyway, get back to like you, you, you being like with like crepuscular and, uh, whatnot species and stuff like, People are just really not into it. Like, I, I, I don't know why. Like, it'll be fine. I've kept them for years. They're fine. And it's like, okay, so how long, how old was your oldest leopard gecko? Uh, it was eight years old. It lived forever. I'm just like, <laughs> eight, eight years old. Okay. Like, yeah, that's a really long time, like longevity wise for a leopard gecko. Like, I've got a bearded dragon that was nearly 17 when he died. Yeah. Yeah. They live like, way longer ne- than people ne- think. Yeah. Like, I, what, what's it say on the internet for something like a bearded dragon? Like, average lifespan, eight to 12 years. Like, I got, I literally got double that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> by just supplying him with the, with, with what he needs. So, yeah. But yeah, when it comes to like husbandry advice and guidance and stuff like that for um, not just like customers and stuff, but like uh, people on the internet, like I've stopped commenting now because you get these people like proper like little Karens that have been keeping beta dragons for about half an hour and like they think that they're like the David Attenborough of the beta dragon world. And it's like, okay, like oh, well, my bearded dragon's got a four-poster bed and an ensuite, and <laughs> he likes bubble baths. And I'm like, like, really? Yeah. Like, okay, fine, whatever. Just don't bother me. Yeah, yeah. It's not, <laughs> you don't want to subject yourself to too much of that because it hurts the brain. But as, as far as yes. for, for the, yeah. the store goes, like I know this is a big challenge with, with reptile store owners is like, like exactly like you said, there's tons of information on YouTube that is just wrong and it's not providing the, you know, huge channels that are not recommending UVB, that are not recommending in, enrichment and whatnot. So you have customers coming into the store who are expecting to spend $80 on something and in reality, they should probably be spending 300 or something like that. And how difficult is that to get to make sales when you have customers who really just want to probably tell you to f off and let them buy something? Oh no, that has happened. <laughs> that has happened. So I've been punched, kicked, spat at. Um, yeah, my, my other members of staff. Like I've got two members of staff um, that are gay, and they've had homophobic abuse held at them um, just because we won't sell them the animal. Uh, because their setup is absolutely diabolical. Like it's li- like when was it? Oh, it was about three three Christmases ago. This lady came in, um, and she had like a little like a large flat fanarium like that. You know the ones from Mexico, are, like the biggest flat ones. Um, she had that, and she had like a heat mat. Um, no thermostat, no nothing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, she was like, "I just bought this off Facebook. It's a full leopard gecko setup." I'm like, "No, that's not a full leopard gecko setup. This is a full leopard gecko setup." Um, and she was like, "Oh well, that's a lot more expensive. Like we do like leopard gecko like setups for like I think it's 200 quid, um, and that comes with um, the enclosure." Um, the UVB heating thermostat, two thermometers. Um, it comes with four hides, uh, shed support, moss uh, for some of the hides, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, but all literally, she had what was that? So, it's I understand that money is an issue, but I think and this is going to sound really harsh, and it's probably going to be quite controversial. But I think if you can't afford the animal then you shouldn't you shouldn't get it like i don't agree with doing things for animals on the cheap so for example if that animal gets ill how are you then going to pay for its medical care like do you know what i mean 
people struggle, especially like where I'm from, like Grimsby, putting money together to get the boxes of life food. Like our boxes of life food are one of the cheapest in the country. They're one pound eighty a tub. Whereas like compared to like London, I think way on, I think you're looking at anywhere from three fifty to a fiver. So, but people struggle, like struggle with that. Like one of my customers, he loves his reptiles that much that he actually goes without food. Wow. So he can he, he has a separate bank account for his reptiles. He's only got two uh, beta dragons, bless him, um, and an African pygmy hedgehog. And, but he has a separate bank account. So half of his pension goes on that. And it's like wow! Like, and he, he said to me in the past, like, oh, I've I've gone without, um, I've gone without uh, food like this week. Ha ha ha! And then obviously, you feel bad. So you just like, okay, here's some like free food, yeah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah, that type of thing. You, you, do feel, you do feel really bad. But as far as educating like the customers, it is it is really difficult. Um, and it was really difficult for the first like two to three years. Um, because there were other reptile shops um, in the area that focused on like exotics and stuff. Um, and they just <clears throat> just went fairly quickly because they were not that great. Um, I think it's, I think as well, nowadays, people are, which is a good thing, people are more in tune to the actual welfare of their animals. So, um, and as well, we, we, we get families in, like, we get families like for like the kids and stuff and the kids just want to do the best like they can for the animal. And that's like really nice. It's actually quite humbling to be fair. It brings you like back down like a little bit and you're like, okay, no, like I see these animals every single day, but not many people do. So yeah, but yeah, it is difficult though. It is difficult. We don't get as many agro people nowadays though um, because we have everything listed out. Like we have signs in the shop um like of proof of setup so if you want if you've already got the setup from somewhere else we require proof of it blah 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 and um, that's everywhere all of the facebook posts and stuff like we also um add like little tricks and tips and stuff um for people um like it can be like enrichment ideas um or we'll post an article um or we'll post a podcast on there um so yeah so just uh it, it's just about educating people and the more information that's out there to try and like crush the disinformation, um, the better, I think. And I, I do generally feel that for the most part, it is swaying more to our side. I think people are getting shown up. I totally um, agree. Quite a lot. Like, like quite a lot. I mean, I, I can remember like just obviously... I would just go back to Brian. I'm not picking on him personally because there are plenty of other people that are very similar to him, but he's like the most, probably like the well-known um, type person. Like one, that's bad anyway, that he's the most well-known person in the actual hobby. Um, and two, um, people are watching these things and taking his advice as, as gospel. And it's like, no, but I think when I was younger and really into um, like animal bites and snake bites TV and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like this, this guy knows, this guy knows. And um, but I don't think that's really the case anymore. I think people are coming away from that from from a logical perspective. Like, snakes don't belong in little tubs yeah. with no light and just a hide and a water bowl, like, and next to no substrate as well. Especially for animals that like require high humidity, like. I know he is kept um, like rainbow boas on like this tiny amount of like cocoa fiber that was like dry as hell. Like he picked it out and it was like super dry. And it's like, why? Like these require really high like humidity. Like why would you do that? Like I don't know. Just get a deep. If you're gonna keep them in tubs, just get a deeper tub. Like and put more substrate yeah. in there. Like we all know that like the thicker the substrate, the easier it's gonna be to regulate your humidity. Easy. We all know this. Yeah. This is common, but well, should be common knowledge. So, I don't know. Well, sorry, it, it, I get ranty about <laughs> things. No, it's good. That's what <laughs> this is for. It's all about ranting. And I, one thing I was thinking about, as far as the economics of the store goes, I imagine that if you really focus heavily on welfare and promoting good products, and you know UVB and large enclosures and whatnot, you probably get you probably on average have less customers who spend more money 
So it probably ends up being more profitable for you as a store who's focused on welfare because you're going to have me as a customer. I'm going to come in. I'm going to get all my UV from you. I'm going to get my thermostats, everything, rather than the store down the street who's just, you know, sort of puppy mill style selling ball pythons with like little little plastic containers. Yeah, they're going to have way more customers, but each customer is going to be spending like, you know, $50 rather than your customers are going to be spending a couple hundred. And they want to do it because you want to do it for the animals. Yeah. That's just a speculation on my part. I'm not sure if that's what you see. Um, I think, I think you are kind of right in, in what you say. Um, it would be great if, if that was the actual case, but people still think they know best. Like, and that is like the really sad thing. Like, so I've, I'm 25 now. So in a sense, I've been keeping reptiles for 15 years. I've been updating my practice for 15 years, constantly, constantly doing research, evaluating, criticizing what I've done in the past. Like just going back to the bearded dragons and stuff um, that I used to keep. Like all I had in there was um, a sand mat, um, two bits of cork bark, a compact UV, um, and a ceramic. That, that was it. So now I can look back and go, okay, so that was wrong for this, 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 and this, and this. Um, and yeah, I, I like being very critical and evaluating myself in not just with reptiles, but in every single aspect. I mean, I don't think you can grow as a person in general if you're not constantly doing that. Because if you're getting constantly told you're amazing, you're this, you're that, you're not going to update your practice. Um, and I think that's really important that as keepers, we should always be looking at ourselves in the mirror and go, right, what was good, what was bad, what worked, what didn't work, how can we move on from this situation? Um, like, that, like, like, like fish people, for example, way ahead, way ahead, way, way, way ahead. Like, um, and I think that's because, about, I don't know why that is, to be fair. I don't know why fish people are way ahead, but it just seems like reptiles in general um, as far as communities go, I mean, even the Arachnid community, like they're like quite like more advanced in their care than reptile people are. Like, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. I think it's quite a lot of different factors feeding in. So I don't think there's just like a distinct reason why. Yeah, and I, I say it all the time too with the <laughs> aquarium hobby. Like they are miles ahead, and and you know it's interesting hearing you describe your bearded dragon enclosure from you know when you were ten. <clears throat> you can find that identical enclosure out there right now with several people. You know that that's the enclosure that you would get sold if you yeah. went to PetSmart or Petland, and you see it all the time, which is so weird to think that's fifteen years ago. What other thing in your life would you start, like, imagine using a cell phone that's 15 years old or, you know, a TV that's 15 years old. Everything is progressing, but you can still find reptile care from the mid-2000s popping up right now, like the sand mat and the compact fluorescent. That is just, you know, status quo for a lot of places. It's so weird. Yeah, it is. It is, it is really weird. So we don't sell compact EVs at all in the shop. It's just a... No, not happening. Um, because it's it's just an easy way out. And it's like, ugh. but the thing is like it's really difficult trying to explain to customers how like the light wavelengths work because I try to dumb it down as much as I possibly can because I know for a fact it's like going to like a car shop, for example, or like an auto part place, and like they just hit you with all this jargon and you're like, Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You haven't got a clue. And like and I think yeah, that's the same thing. So I think it's important for um, like people that are talking about the hobby um, and people that are selling these animals in general um, to just get on the level of the customer like, and just talk to them like people, just like you're sparking up a conversation um, and just reassure them as well. Like, okay, is there anything that you don't understand? Do you want me to go over it again? Like, it's absolutely fine. Don't worry. Like, it's what we're here for. Like, because we get it all the time. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm asking stupid questions. And I'm like, it's not a stupid question. Like, nine, literally nine times out of 10, when people ask questions, uh, when they're like, oh, it might be a stupid question, but it's really not a stupid question. Mm. Like, it's really important. Um, but, I mean, you obviously get that one out of 10 that's just like, what would win out of a bearded dragon and a blue tongue skin? And you're like, 
why are you wasting my time? Like, yeah, yeah. come on. Yeah. So, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's true. And, and the, the newbies often ask the best questions because they, their brain thinks differently than us. And because they're not exposed to the information, like you say, they're going to ask different questions. And you're so right about, there is a, a place to have very advanced conversation about husbandry but that is not with a brand new person to the hobby because you're going to either overwhelm them and they're going to disappear or you're going to overwhelm them and they're just going to stop listening and then go to the simple solution which is the tub and the paper because it's just like I don't even want to think about the physics of light that's just too much so I'm just going to go to the easy side yeah definitely yeah definitely so one thing 100%. I noticed with your, uh, with I think when I was I watched a news clip of you when I maybe mean, we can talk about that after where you guys had a snake get dropped off at the at the front door of your shop. But one thing that I noticed, I think I noticed anyways, on the enclosures, you guys seem to have like little traffic light type stickers. What what are those? Are those a symbol yeah, for something? Yeah, we do. What are those? Yeah. So. Um, they're not really for the customers. They're more for like um, work experience, but you can gauge them for customers as well, like in a sense, but they're predominantly for like, they're for like the work X's and stuff. So obviously we've got green where you can go in the enclosure um, and handle. That's absolutely fine. Um, amber, you probably need a little bit of training on it um, if you don't know how to do it. So like all the frogs are amber, uh, which you might be like, well, why? Um, and it's because you do you know about like the chytrid fungus and stuff like that yeah. that's plaguing yeah. Europe? And, yeah. So, and that's because of that reason. And then we can talk about appropriate water disposal. Like it's all fun stuff. Like, but it's important that, that obviously they know. So it's, it, we, we use the traffic light system as a learning resource. Um, and the black. So we've got like the last level, like DEFCON 5 or like whatever, like the, the, the black ones. Um, that's just a don't bother um even such in like don't, just don't bother it's too dangerous <laughs> what sort of animal would be a black in your store um so in we kind of base it on two things so we base it on number one the temperament of the animal um and then we kind of base it on species so i find anything with like tree in its name apart from frogs are usually vile creatures <laughs> yeah. um but I'd, I'd, I'd still like them anyway um so it it, it would depend it, it's it it was mainly down to the personality um of the animal Got more it. than anything but we, we talk about like this species is typically X, Y, and Z. Like, however, this one is like either on steroids and it's like absolutely crazy. Um, or, well, actually, for this species, typically um, green tree pythons are absolutely horrible, but this one is really, really nice. So it, it, it goes on um, like the severity um, of their personality really more than anything. Got it. That makes sense. Um, that makes sense. So yeah. let, let's jump into your teaching job because you have this other side of your life which you are you teach at a college and <laughs> you teach some pretty interesting courses so tell me about sort of the program that you're in and then we'll jump into a few of the courses that you teach and then some of the projects that you have the students working on yeah so i teach at the grimsby institute um on the in the animal care department um so currently um this term i've got exotics over level uh three um, so level threes are like just come well sometimes just come from school or they're like near enough going to like university like kind of like in between like stage and then we've got like level twos as well which again just come out of school and just need a little bit more coaxing um so we're doing exotics with those but it's different like per module um so currently with the level three uh year twos we've got to design bioactive enclosures uh see and i was just like yes i absolutely love this i've done this so many times over these 15 years um so we used you know a serpa uh, design the youtuber serpa design his yeah we we used uh his tutorial video um and the students wrote down the steps on like how to like carve the backgrounds with the spray foam and stuff like that um so we, we've just currently done that now so we just need to wait for the actual scaping of the enclosures um and obviously putting the live plants in and stuff like that and then they're going to be doing a write-up on the species that they've chosen um for 
the tank that they're designing and how suitable would it be, um, why they've done a bioactive enclosure, what are the benefits, um, that type of thing. So, yeah. And then um, with the level twos, it's more on like handling um, and stuff like that. Uh, so like protocols, procedures, legislation, um, that type of thing at the moment. Um, also do avian um, as well. So that obviously basically just focuses um, on birds. Um, the first assignment for that is due um, this month. Um, and it's about like enrichment and they've, they've made enrichment, take photos of it and put it in their assignments and then like type away um, about it and reference it and stuff like that. But yeah, no, I, my, my, my groups are fantastic. Like I love them so much. Like, I'm so proud of them as well from like, I've only been back teaching again for four weeks, um, but they're just absolutely just fantastic. Like they're just absorbing like everything, like how to use like a snake hook like properly and and whatnot. Um, like cleaning the tortoise, like we've got some big saw carters, like cleaning like the tortoises' shells and um, and whatnot, and doing the enrichment for the tortoises. Like it's it's just good. Like, I I just absolutely love it. Absolutely love so it. So what? The, <laughs> it literally sounds like a dream. Anybody listening to this podcast will just be so jealous of all those students. What what? when they're finished the college, is it, a, do they have a degree or is it a diploma in something like what, what would they, what are these students looking to do? Is it zookeeping yeah. or, or what will they get with this degree or diploma? It can be, it, it, it's a diploma. So from here, they then will go to university or they will then go straight into um, industry. So I thought uh, from my perspective as somebody that is still in industry, um, that we supply these students with industry experience um, as well as how to apply themselves because it's all right having it up here so they can tell me the process but have they actually done it before? Um, so we just get them like down and dirty with it but they would uh, the level threes would finish with their level three uh, diploma in animal management um, and then the, so it's like pass merit or distinction um, like criteria that they have to meet um, and then depending on what they get overall so they could get pass 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 or pass merit merit or distinction 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 uh, if they get distinctions overall then they, they have quite a lot of what's called ucas points so the more ucas points you get um like the better university in a sense i think you get into something like, it's been about 10 years since i've um like properly gone into education again that way <laughs> so <laughs> so are these are these kids are they still in school, high school or is this after high school? Because it's, it's so different in, in Europe. Every time I hear, or in, in, in the UK, every time I hear about these colleges, I'm so jealous because they have these really niche programs, which sound amazing. But for us, it's like you finish high school, you go to university. So are these kids still in high school or is it like a, a, a space between high school and university? Uh, no, it's, it's a space between um, high school or secondary school um, and then uh, university. So typically... Like school leavers start from like 16 to 18 plus. Um, that's what we have, um, really. So, yeah, it's really fun. I absolutely love it. Yeah, no, that sounds <laughs> amazing. Like, I can't imagine setting up a viv for a, an assignment at school. So, will the kids actually get animals for those enclosures that they're setting up, or is it just more theoretical? Um, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, if if their uh, if their enclosure that they've designed um, is suitable enough, so I'm not helping them in a sense. Uh, obviously, I'm helping them. I'm giving them the, the tools they need, but um, it's basically they need to decide for themselves. Um, so it's quite a personal like task in a sense. Like if they're going wrong, I'm like, hey, no, put it this way. Like, or if they need excuse me, if they need advice on like decor and stuff, then obviously I can give it. But if they're in, if the enclosure that they've um, designed is suitable for the animal that they've chosen and as well, if the animal isn't like ridiculously expensive, um, then hopefully touch wood, um, there we go, touch wood, uh, then, <laughs> uh, then hopefully we'll be able to put the animals in there. For them, so and would yeah. they be able to keep the Quite enclosure? Cool. Like, would they be able to keep the animal? <laughs> no, no, no. It's for it's for the college, oh, so okay. it'll be at college for them. Very so, cool. Yeah, well, I'll get like a little plaque, made, get a little plaque made for them. So that's amazing. Yeah. So, and, and one of the obviously one of the focuses that you teach is is exotic welfare and exotic in the in the pet trade as well. Like like you said at the beginning, there is a lot of dark area in the pet hobby. So even though we don't often like seeing or talking about it. We do want to talk about it a little bit, but also, you know, 
bolster that with the fact that we can do a much better job. So do you cover kind of the dark sides of the pet hobby and then, and then, and then sort of bake in yeah. welfare and how, and I'm, I'm guessing these kids are very responsive to the increased welfare. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So we, um, uh, last week we did, um, a bit of a debate. Um, it was on ethical sourcing of exotic animals. So we covered wild caught, uh, captive farmed, long-term captive and captive bred. Now, before I went into anything, we discussed what each one was. Um, so obviously wild caught straight from the wild uh, to, all the way through to captive bred, born in captivity. And I went, just before obviously we start, which way do you think is like more ethical? What's the best way? Blah, blah, blah. And obviously at that point, they all said captive bred. So when we went further into it. I'd separated them into their four groups. Um, so people were researching wild courts and people were researching, um, captive bred, long-term captive, uh, captive farmed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they had 20 minutes, half an hour to do this. And they basically had to defend their point on why their point was the most ethical. Um, and it was really interesting. Like it got, it got quite spicy with some of the groups because uh, we did this over multiple groups. Um, like they got really into it. Like one of them like nearly cried because um, <laughs> because because they got that into it. Like so, for example, uh, wild caught. One of them was just like, "You're paying like um, these poor Indonesian people next to absolutely nothing. Uh, you make me sick, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And then like the uh, wild caught people were like, we don't do this. I'm only, it's only a task. Like, um, but at the end of it, um, we obviously discussed everything, like the flip side of it. So if we didn't have wild caught, then we wouldn't have access to fresh bloodlines, um, like within the hobby. It's the father of the hobby of animal keeping in general. Um, whether obviously you agree with that or not, that wasn't the topic of discussion, but um, it's obviously a thing. Uh, and then with captive bred, we spoke about uh, morph breeders um, and people getting these snakes with and leopard geckos um, with really bad um, health issues. Uh, so like stargazing, obviously the spinning round of the head um, in spider royals, et cetera, et cetera. And we spoke about it like that as well. So um, when I asked the same question, okay, so what do you think is the most ethical? And the answer that I was hoping for was it's a gray area. And they all said, that's a massive gray area. Then they're not one in the same. I'm like, exactly. So you could have people that are catching animals from the wild that are doing it fairly ethically. Um, that are treating them for like diseases, parasites, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that are paying the people a fair enough wage. And then you've got the flip side of that where people aren't doing that. Um, and you've got that in every single aspect. Um, so it's not, it's not clear cut. And that's basically what I try to get into them, that it's not as easy and black and white as what people think. Yes. So, yeah, that's so, so it yes. works. It works. Yeah, that's awesome. That and that's so true. It's it nothing is clear cut. And I think it's because we're dealing with animals and wildlife and biology and there's it's not like mathematics where there's right or wrong and like where it's immediately obvious. And I think that's where the animal rights groups go wrong is they do think it's just black and white and it's very simple to look at and you know, there there's good and bad on both sides. Like I hate to see massive amounts of wild caught going to like PetSmart, but at the same time like we need some new blood into the hobby. And we also want some new animals to you know to preserve if it's an animal that's in a you know a, an environment that's getting damaged and we might lose them in the next 15 or 20 years we got to start pulling some of those genetics out of the wild so absolutely there's a time and a place for for both yeah yeah definitely um another thing that we um talked about was within captive bred people crossing uh localities because uh, they don't understand that actually this animal is different from um fr from that animal um, mainly obviously happens with like tarantulas and stuff like that because they do look fairly similar to the untrained eye. Um, but yeah, like hobby form, um, H gigas and stuff like that. Like, yeah, just crazy weird stuff. Um, but yeah, they, they, they all seem really receptive to it. Um, I think it's because it's different. Like they've never, it, it's the first time that um, this exotics module has ever been taught here. Um, 
and the avian module um, as well. So it's not only a learning curve for me, but they're like, oh my God, like we're not just working with rabbits and guinea pigs and stuff today. I'm just like, yeah, like you see that snake? Yeah, use that snake hook and pick it up. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> so who, who created the the module for this this course? Is it Was it the, your college that put it together or is it somewhere somewhere else? Uh, no, that's the um, bird. Um, <laughs> no, it was, okay. Thanks, Kiwi. Um, no, it's the we have city and guilds, um, which they're the ones that create. So they're like exam boards. They create the um, assignments and stuff. So yeah, um, yeah. it's not the college that does it. So, but there are like different kinds of them. So they all work up to credits. So you can have like thirty credits. So exotics maybe five credits. Avian will be five credits. Health will be ten credits. Um, and then business will be 10 credits. So it like makes it all up to the 30. It's just such a cool idea because if you expose the people, if you expose the reptile hobby to people that way first, they're never going to revert to anything. They're going to be constantly approaching it from this sort of more philosophical point of view, right? They're going to be thinking about things much deeper. And I think like you were saying at the beginning, and I was the same way, most of us jumped into the hobby at a very simple kind of small minded mindset, like get an animal, get your you know paper substrate and you're good to go. And there's a few of us like you and I who slowly evolved over time to start thinking about things deeper. And that's where you learn all the gratification from the hobby and everything. But it is so cool to start somebody from that point of view. It's like, how do you, st- how can you think about this from a, a much larger mindset? Like, I think that will just radiate out because those people are going to talk. You know, they whoever those students exposed to the hobby later on in life are going to use the same philosophy. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's the, uh, I think that's what we're trying to like get because like, a lot of them as well were like fairly scared of them. Um, I think some of them are scared, which, which is absolutely fine. Mm-hmm. Like. Um, but I'm slowly winning them around. I think I'm ho- hopefully anyway, I'm hopefully winning them around, um, with it all, but yeah, but like the, my main focus really for them, um, is just like welfare, just like up, not just with reptiles in general, but any animal, just like update your welfare. Mm-hmm. Like that's it. Like why, why would you just want to like settle for the minimum? Like you want the animal to thrive, not survive. Yeah. Like, like that's it exactly so, yeah that's a huge key yeah. so tell me we were talking a little bit before before we started recording um tell me about the tiger king assignment <laughs> um so during lockdown we were still teaching but over um like the internet and stuff and uh tiger king came out and we were doing um a assignment on uh behavior and stereotypical behaviors and um, and stuff like that um and i was watching it And I was like, okay, so apart from this like crazy man and the murder plot and everything, what's going on, this is actually a really good learning tool. Um, So I suggested uh, to the students, I was like, look, watch the Tiger King um, and let's talk about the welfare implications that he has there. Um, And if you can find out some legislation, maybe from overseas or, or even here, on um, like size requirements for um, tigers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately there's next to nothing. There's literally next to nothing. Um, like it's, it's, it's crazy, but it, it, it was, it was really good. It was really good. Cause then obviously we've got like the sayings like goddamn Carol Baskin, <laughs> like, and like, and all that. So it made the lesson in general, like fun. So I always try to like spice my lessons up. Like anyway, like I don't, I don't want them to be like really boring. So just going back on to when we did the, um, the bioactive enclosure design and stuff like that. So I took them out into the quad, which is where like all like the sheep, uh, the rear, the ducks, the turtles, et cetera, et cetera, where all these are and the meerkats and stuff, like where they all live like outside. Um, there's like trees and stuff like that. And we went out and we went looking for like sticks and stuff like that. And like, it was really good. I was like, look, look for sticks with character. Like, don't just get like a normal, like long stick, get something that's got some knots, some twists and stuff like that. And like they did, they actually did the spray foam yesterday and it's just very good. It's very good. But I think that's important. Like for education to be like fun as well. Like, 
and keep it relevant. So the reason why we obviously did it on the Tiger King was because it was really relevant and people will be taking in this information without even realizing they're taking it in. So I'm like, okay, so-and-so, like what happened um, when the tiger was like pacing up and down? Why do you think it would be doing that? Oh, da 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 um, Yeah, so it, it, it was really fun. I, I really enjoyed well, it. I, think, I just love my job. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> and I think that's the key is that you're very passionate about what you're teaching. And so often we're, we encounter educators or instructors or teachers who are just there to teach because they have to teach this course. And it becomes mm-hmm. boring. Like they're not interested in it. They're not excited. But if you have somebody who's passionate about a topic... It, it would be impossible mm-hmm. to not enjoy that course and not to have fun. Like, like none of that sounds like boring schoolwork to me. All of that sounds like the kids are probably excited to get to school and excited to do the assignments. <laughs> yeah, I, well, well, I hope so. Um, I, get, I have like pretty good attendance anyway, so hopefully that will reflect in what they're actually learning is, is quite fun. Um, but yeah, I, I just think it's really important that like, especially like on an animal care course, that... People don't just focus on guinea pigs, rabbits, like, et cetera, because it's been hashed out so many times. There are so many, like, lit papers um, on them and stuff like that. And like, there's next to nothing on, like, reptiles. So we've got a couple of students from two different universities. And so the University of Grimsby, and I think one's from the University of Hull. So one's, uh, they're doing the research project at my shop. So one's doing their research project on um, genetics and phenotype of leopard geckos um, and gene expression. Um, One's doing it on the temperature, um, depending on that sex and stuff. Um, And then one is doing it on four groups of royal pythons, um, to one in a rub um, without UV, one in a rub with UV, one in a viv with UV, and one in a viv without UV. Um, and they're going to be doing like similar like testings and stuff. So like weight gain, et cetera, et cetera. See if there is an actual difference between UV. If rubs are better, which I don't think it's probably going to be a thing. Like, well, they're scared. They don't like open spaces. I'm like, oh yeah, because in Africa, there's loads of rubs in Africa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they usually have about a foot of square space, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, and as well, like top heat as well. Like, it's something as basic um, as that. Like talking to the students and stuff about it. Like, oh, so, so why do you think having top heat is better? And it's like, hmm, hmm. It's like because it's more natural for them. Like, it's way more natural. Like for my my personal collection. Um, for the most part, I use halogens and deep heat projectors, obviously with like UV strips, so I can hit the majority of the spectrum with Jungle Dawn um, LEDs as well. So they're, it's as close as I possibly can to getting it. So I'm currently redesigning my um, carpet python enclosure. So it it's going to be 10 foot tall, by four and a half foot by four and a half foot wow um yeah so i'm gonna and i'm gonna do it with uh like live plants and stuff like that maybe get some like australian like memorabilia and pop that in there just to make it look a, a little bit like funky and stuff um maybe introduce um some white tree frogs in there potentially um as well um, so yeah, I'm all for multi-species enclosures. Okay. So now I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> you just opened up a can. <laughs> so I, I, okay. I want to definitely get back to the jungle, the carpet Python, uh, enclosure for sure. But before we do that, as far as those students doing that research, is that something that's going to be, I'm sure that's an assignment that we won't be able to see, but will, will they be posting those results anywhere for people to see? Um, I think so. I, th- I think if it gets published, then I think, um, potentially well, we'll stay in like, touch if so if it happens then you can send it to me and I can make sure people see it because I think that would be really neat yeah 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 definitely I, I don't think there's that many topics out there that discuss like snakes and UV um, it's still like a really taboo which just really bores me it's just like oh like why we know these things need the D3 cycle like it happens like we, we know this happens like let them do it just, <laughs> just, yeah. just let-, let them synthesize D3 <laughs> Yeah, like, oh, even like inverts and stuff. Like, even some of my tarantulas now, like I've started, because I've, um, the podcast with John Courtney Smith, I think it was when he was talking about invertebrates um, and like D3 and, and stuff like that. 
And like, I mean, I've had jungle dawns on some of my invert enclosures anyway because of like the live plants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I've just started to put UV. And like my Mexican red knee, like she was always hiding, like, all, like honestly, like all the time, always hiding, always in a burrow. And I'm just like, is this normal behavior or am I doing something wrong? Like, because she'd come out for a bit and then she'd go in. But ever since I've supplied her with the UV, she has been out constantly, like constantly. I'm like, hmm, am I doing something wrong? Like, yeah, that's amazing. That's, well, we know they, they they do synthesize vitamin D as well, so it's it's really not surprising mm. that they. She'll probably maybe over time after she's accumulated enough, she'll start basking less. But she might be topping up those sources after being low for so long, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully, because I, I got her when she was like tiny like this big i found her in um a cricket tub because you know sometimes you get like cricket tub spiders and stuff and then like i'll I'll open this cricket tub and i was like oh cricket tub spider oh wait no no this this is fluffy like this is not a cricket tub spider so because at this point i didn't know what it was so i kept her and kept her and kept her and then she grew and i was like oh my god it's a mexican red knee like i'm so happy like at the time smithy now homori like she's definitely a homori now um but yeah i was like this is cool wow that's awesome i mean because yeah Yeah. when they're slings you can't tell they just look like spiders you can't tell what what they are like little house spiders yeah yeah just like a little fluffy like spider i was like "Hmm, okay yeah. So I'll do with let's this. jump back to that carpet python. So how, how big is your carpet python to begin with? Uh, so Noah is uh, d- 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 just over six foot. Okay. And what is just over? Six how foot. are you building that enclosure? Like what do you what materials? Um, so I'm going to be using um, OSB uh, for the most of it because uh, obviously it's fairly um, fairly cheap. I'm going to do like a barn style type door um, with perspex uh, like windows and stuff on there. Um, and then I'm going to have about two and a half foot worth of deep substrate um, in there. So the humidity can be regulated um, like a lot better. And it's going to be better for like the plants um, and stuff as well. Um, so, and then obviously the rest of the um, like UV, et cetera, et cetera, is going to be in there. So I think, what I'll probably do is I'll give them a higher Ferguson zone or a higher percentage of UV. So it will penetrate down further. So, um, and then I'll set the basking spot up that way around. So in the sense that they're still getting it. And then if he wants to do a backdoor bogey, he can, uh, he can do a backdoor bogey from the UV. So, yeah. Oh, that's going to be very <laughs> cool. So do you have 10-foot ceilings in your home or, or, or your flat where you live? Yeah, so it's it's at the shop. So oh, all my collection now is it? Yeah, all my collections at the shop. So it's like a really old, like, Victorian-style, like, house. Like, it was made, like, before, like, World War One. Like, it's hella old. Like, and the ceilings are just absolutely ridiculous. Like, they're so tall. It's uh, it's unbelievable, which is, which is a good thing. Um, it's a good thing, to be fair. So... Yeah, I mean, I got him from the Doncaster Reptile Show about five years ago, and the lady said that he's just been kept in a rub like all of his life. And I'm like, okay, so you've got like a semi arboreal snake just in a rub. Yeah. Mm, okay. Let's fix that. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. So and he was twenty five quid as well, twenty five wow. pound, and she didn't ask. She didn't ask me any questions. Um, nothing. She just went, oh, I've just been kept in a rub for X amount of years, and I'm like. Okay, cool. Do you know what so kind of carpet that's python why I have, like, such a, uh, Coastal. Oh, it's a coastal, okay. That's why I have such a disdain for reptile shows and reptile expos. I hate them with a the passion now anyway. You've just like, opened up another can of worms. <laughs> 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 okay, I want to talk about that as well, as long as you still have a few minutes. Do you still have a few minutes to... Uh, yeah, 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 sure, man. So yeah. uh, b- uh, before we do that, I want to jump back to the mixed species uh, vivs because I-, I agree that I think... Like one, like I've talked about this before. Where again, this is where the aquarium hobby or the aquarium hobby does this. They mix species all the time, and I know it's not an exact perfect comparison, but I do think we're going to start seeing more of that in the reptile hobby as we advance and as we learn what species. Because typically, cohabbing is like the number one. Do not talk about. Do not do. But there could be some some nuance there where we can do some mixed species. So, do you have anything at the shop that's mixed species, or is, will this carpet python and white trees frog kind of be the first experience? Oh, no. No, I've done... Um, my first mixed species uh, enclosure was 
about five and a half, six years ago, maybe. And it was a three foot by three foot B45 Exoterra. And I had two um, Florida rough green snakes um, in there, um, four American green tree frogs, um, two Cope's gray tree frogs, um, some fish in the bottom. I basically did like a kind of like a Florida esque type uh, setup. I even got like a little license plate and put it put it in there and whatnot. Like kind of did it like a pond um, type thing, and that worked really well, like re- really well. So um, again, e- even even back then, I was still supplying them with UVB. Uh, obviously, jungle dawns were out then, so I did my own thing and got LEDs that I could find that were the closest to the color of natural light um, and popped them um, on there. Um, it was just just to try it out, really, um, because I was like, okay, I can't really do a multi-species enclosure um, for like big stuff because I simply just do not have the room for that. And I thought for the smaller stuff like those, the the biggest exoterror was fairly suitable. So I would before I put the animals in, um, I would check their home ranges and like ideal temps and stuff like that. Um, and I would look for areas and I'd assess, okay, so I think that the white street, the whites, the, um, American green tree frogs are going to go here because it's like a little bit warmer up here and the humidity is a little bit higher. Whereas I think the copes will probably go in the middle of the enclosure. Um, and I think that the Florida rough greens will hunt in the water and be right at the top. Um, and I wasn't right about the frogs, but I was right about the uh, about the snake. So the frogs were, they were just happy anywhere, just like milling about. Um, I also got them to breed in the tank as well, which was quite cool. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it is a very interesting. And of course, there's tons of things you have to consider, like you say, range and everything. And you can't just go and put two huge animals together and expect it to work out. And there's lots of things. So it's definitely not a beginner thing to do at all. But at the same right, time, like right. there, there could be, as long as you have the space to do it. And like you say, using smaller animals, there could be some interesting mixes that you can do that actually end up working well. So the first, yeah. So the first thing that I looked at when I was doing it was, um, diet, like, because there'd be no point, for example, in putting like a garter snake in there because they, do like snacky snack on frogs like yeah. it would like <laughs> but with the florida of green obviously predating main like predominantly like on like insects and like smaller bits and bobs and stuff like that um i thought oh okay um why not like all these things eat insects um the frogs aren't gonna get too big um where if they do get to that point they're gonna eat the snake um, cause that was also a concern. Like I'm not going to whack a white tree frog in there cause I'd be like some green spaghetti, <laughs> like for the white, <laughs> for the white tree frog. Um, so yeah, th- there was lots of things that like I had to, had to like really, really, really think about, really think about, but I'm in the process as well of like doing my classroom at the shop and the classroom at the shop, I'm going to have, um, hopefully anyway, like a big greenhouse attached to the side. And then I'm going to do an enclosure with a couple of um, iguana, iguana, um, like maybe red foot tortoises, um, like dart frogs, um, maybe as well, depending on maybe some axolotls. If the uh, water temperature isn't too high, then maybe whack them in there um, as well. Just, but well, that's like a long one because obviously those animals are fairly large. So yeah. I need to make sure that everything's like, perfect before i apart from, from the dark bugs and stuff but i need to make sure everything's perfect before i actually go into that yeah so well it's those are really interesting projects so we'll have to keep an eye on for that it's, let, let's uh, wrap up finishing with the uh the expos and and the, and the shows because it, this is one of those areas where it i, I like people enjoy going to the shows and I enjoy going to shows too because you get to see all these animals, you get to see different things and it's, it's fun to interact with people if we ever get one again, who knows. But at the same time, it is impossible to ignore the clear ethical issues with it and that is mm-hmm. the fact that a lot of impulse purchases are, are, being, are, are being made and it, 
you're, you're selling animals to people that don't necessarily know what they're getting into. They don't know they're buying a ball python that could live for 50 years. Where does that snake go? So I'm, I'm, maybe you could just jump in and, and, and kind of share your thoughts on the shows. Um, I hate them. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just absolutely hate them. So like at the time, like, I was very, very, very similar to you. I was like, oh my God, like these animals, blah, 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 blah. And then just like, that like but is it good mm -hmm. is it really ethical like uh like yeah well, well they're not in here for long and i'm like but you've got people that are traveling from scotland down here and it it just doesn't sit right with me like not only for for the fact that the tubs they have them and obviously they can't put them in like big vivaria like all and show them that way but Jesus Christ, just give them some space. Like it's not, it's not difficult. Like I think it's that whole mentality of like, especially royal python breeders. No, like stop, just, just stop, just stop it. Like just the market is saturated to a, a ridiculous amount. Um, even one of my friends is a royal python breeder, and he is exactly the same as me. But he's more of um, he does it more of like the hobbyist thing, instead of wanting it to turn it for a profit. And it just seems like most people want to turn them out for a profit. Like when I suggested um, in the forums and stuff, not four weeks ago. Ah, oh, I'm thinking about supplying UVB with um, my in my racking system. What do you think the first thing I got back was? One, they don't need it. And two, you're not going to make any money. You're an absolute idiot. And then some more expletives. And I got something very similar from the leopard, from the leopard gecko hobby people when I was like, okay, so I'm going to do this um, as well. What do you lot think? I mean, the Leo people were like, oh my God, that sounds really good. But then other people were just like, again, they don't need UVB. Mm, okay, whatever. Sorry, granddad. <laughs> and then like the second one, like you're not going to make any money. And it's like, well, long, short term, maybe not, but long term, I will, because the clutches will be healthier in a sense, like a lot healthier. People are going to know that the animals are healthy because they have been under this UV. Um, and yeah, so I am, the, in a sense, the animals aren't going to be healthier. So and you'll probably get more it. production, not only, Will they be healthier? You'll probably get more babies. Well, well, that'll be interesting. That because I've bred royals and leopard geckos and stuff in the past, um, and so I've I've still got the data from that at my house somewhere. So, but I'm one of those people that's very meticulous and counts everything down. And like, if there was a problem with the clutch or something like that, I have these records. But another reason why I don't like the shows and stuff is so. I feel personally that when it comes to reptiles and stuff, like I'm no expert and I'll never profess to be an expert like, at all. And I think people that do profess to be an expert um, should just cease because I think personally to me anyway, going to slide off on a tangent, like every day is a school day and you can learn yeah. like from everything. But I know for a fact, I know how to care for certain species. Like if I don't know how to care, I will ask like, I'm not that pride hurt where I'm like, oh, okay, like, like Dylan, I don't know how to care for like rainbow bows. Could you help me out? Like, and I'm sure obviously you'd be like, yeah, sure, dude. Like, here's X, Y, and Z on rainbow bows. Like, yeah. I'm not afraid of that. But yeah, but just people aren't like that at all. And it just the whole thing with the shows, not asking questions. Like, the only one person that asked me a question was when, because we used to get our stock from there, like when we first opened and stuff, before I knew better. Um, it was when I bought some sulcatas and they were like, oh, do you know how big like these guys get? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I know. And then he went through it with me, uh, but these are probably male, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So he was the only person in, and I've been to umpteen shows, both Inver and Reptile, umpteen shows. And he's the first person that has asked me, do you know what you're doing? Do you know the size of these animals? And I think it's bad. And I think people need to stop looking at the money 
and start looking at the animals because if people keep looking at the money, more and more animals are going to get abandoned because they keep churning them out. And then there's going to be more legislation dumped on us that we can only do this, this, we can only keep this, et cetera, et cetera. And it's because of people like that that are irresponsibly breeding. Like, and it is. I'm just, I, again, I'm ranting like properly again, but like, it's, it's just one of them things. I just, I'm an out, when it comes to like the reptile hobby and stuff, like that, I'm a proper outsider. Like, my ideals don't really sit with quite a lot of people because they're just like pet tubers and stuff like that. But don't get me wrong, there are people out there that are pretty good. Like, I quite like snake discovery. Like, she's, she's, she's pretty good. Like, um, Okay, I'm trying to think of any of the ones that I like. Um, well, Serpa Design. Uh, Camp Kennan. Serpa Design, Camp Kennan. Mm -hmm. Like, really good. Like, that Camp Kennan, that man is ridiculously enthusiastic. Yeah. And I love it. Yeah. Like, his enclosures, he doesn't, he's not scared to show you. And we're just like, hey, look at this. Look how big everything is. And I'm like, yes, Camp Kennan. Yes, this is good. I like this. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. You're, it's it, you're making great points, and like you know, there's always this image when you walk into a show and you'll see one table that's just full of retic babies, and that mm. is like I think that's like the poster child for issues with with shows. You know, it's like yeah, those are all 15, 18, 20 foot snakes, and there's forty of them on this table, and everybody here is a random person. Like you know. If someone's buying those, they're probably going to put them in like an eight foot cage or, or something like that. And that is just one of the hugest issues. One of the, those issues with the hobby that we see with large animals that are always kept in way too small enclosures. And, and that just is sort of the epitome of it is seeing a, a, a table full of, you know, 40 babies. And uh, it's something that we can't ignore in the hobby. Yeah. Like personally, I, I don't agree with it. I don't agree. This is another reason why people, um, don't necessarily like me like within the hobby like i don't think that the average person can care for a reticulated python that gets x amount of fee Agreed. like 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 at, like at all like i've like if, if i had a choice i would not own reticulated pythons like unfortunately unfortunately i own one and i own a berm as well but i didn't i acquired those because they were in such bad well apart from the retic retic wasn't bad it was quite a sad story with that one but um the burmese python that i got jesus christ like it had three layers of shed stuck on it it was uh eight foot and it was kept in a three foot by two foot fish tank oh my god just on a heat mat like and it's like are you actually being serious? Like this poor animal, like also like its tongue, it's had some damage to its tongue. Like it's just like a fist instead of like the fork. Like, I'd, I don't know, but I like, and big monitors as well. Don't agree keeping big monitor species like at all. Like I kind of liken it to, okay, so mammals, do you think you can own every single mammal in the taxa? Mm. Whereas people think they can own every single animal in the reptile taxa. Yes. And it's like, it's like there's a difference. So I would liken like maybe just like a domestic cat to like raw python or a corn snake. And then like a lion, for example, something like the bigger stuff, like the advance in care. Um, and these things are dangerous as well, like really dangerous. Like I had to prize a, um, how big was she? She's like 12 or 14 foot a 12 or 14 foot reticulated python off a guy's face in my shop. Oh my God. Like she, she literally just went like that. And I was basically, I was sexing her and, um, I was like, are you going to restrain her head properly? But like the guy had like just got it. Um, he was like, Oh no, no, no. She'll be absolutely fine. Blah, 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 blah. I was like, but you've just got the animal. Um, but yeah, anyway, against my better judgment, I was like, okay, fine, whatever. I did say to him that I was just like, look, like, how would you like it if I like shoved a metal rod up your ass? Like, do you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, um, you might and he was just like, <laughs> <too>. <laughs> yeah, like, um, so I did it and got it in. And then, like, the scene, I was like, oh, it's a girl. Like, she just whipped round and got him um, on it, across his face. Like, it was like on that part of the school, right to the chin. And like, she was like going for it, like proper going for it. Now that was the first time I'd ever seen a retic do that. Like you hear about these things, but like you, you never actually see it until it's there. And you're like, right, like shit. Like I'm 20 years old. 
um, what do I do? Yeah. So I was like, right, stay calm. Like, just try and unwrap it. So I was unwrapping the coils from the tail first. And then I, I like put them on um, his friend that he was with. And then his friend was just like, what if it bites me? I was like, don't worry, the bitey ends on your mate's face. Like, it, it's <laughs> it's absolutely fine. So after that, I she let go finally after I got most of the coils off. Obviously, I secured her like back of her head and then put her in the in the tub. Nicest pie after that. She was really good. Um, and then the ambulance had to come and there was just like, you could see his skull like there and you could see his chin bone. Oh my and God. like, uh, honestly, like the lacerations that were just all over, like it missed his eye completely, which was really lucky. Um, and it just looked like someone had just like squirted like tomato sauce like, all over his face. Like, and there were just bits of skin like peeling and stuff. Like a head was really big. Like a head was like, probably can't see on there, but it was, it was quite big. Like a head was quite big. Um, but yeah. And then he came back two weeks later and gave me like a bottle of celebrations, like the little chocolates, um, and a bottle of vodka to say thank you. And his face was like out here, like for the bruising, oh like it was just. Yeah, it was just crazy. Like, well, but that, that's another reason why I don't agree with it. Yeah. Like, and she was only 12 foot, like, not even fully grown. Yeah, you're only kind of like, halfway at that point. And it's so true. Like, are there people that are equipped to handle that? Yes. But is the average reptile person? No, it, it, it kind of like your mammal example. It, you wouldn't, you would even, if, even if, if you lived in a city with a small yard, you would second guess getting a Great Dane, even, you know? But so imagine yeah. a, a reticulate python would be more like getting a horse in a backyard, you know? You wouldn't <laughs> get a horse if you had just a lot, you know, a very small backyard. It just doesn't make sense. But that's what happens. So you imagine going into a, a reptile show, it's like, you know, 40 horse babies <laughs> that are the size of, you know, a, a poodle or something, and people go home with them, yeah. and there's no, there's, it's almost like they don't extrapolate further like what are you going to do in 20 years when that snake is 20 feet long yeah exactly exactly pe pe people don't think and then like there's the whole oh it's a granite het pied <laughs> yellow super conda super cadja fragilistic expialidocious one two three four five six seven eight nine ten it's like just start coming up with these ridiculous names like yeah what's wrong with like the wild versions of them the wild types are beautiful like some of these moths just look moldy. Like, <laughs> why? Like, they look like they've got a bit of yeast problem or something. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, you see, especially with uh, ball pythons and royal pythons, you see like, you know, four or five gene animals and it's like, well, you've just created a brown ball python. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, great that it's carrying all these genetics, but I can't, and I'm colorblind too, so half of the morphs I can't distinguish at all. I'm just like, they all look the same. Yeah. But, you know, they start mixing on top of each other and it's just like, there's a tan snake. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't understand it. I've, uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm just not. This, this is what I mean. Like, just getting back to it. Like, this. I'm, I'm kind of like an outlier, like in the hobby. So, like, when you first asked me to like come on, I'm just like, well, not nobody knows like who I am, and like, I think they'll probably get annoyed with what, <laughs> with what I say, staring the hornet's nest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, a lot of the people that listen to the show have a very similar mindset, and you know. The, I picture myself as being totally outside of the hobby as well. And I've said that before on the show that I, I've had animals for, I guess, whatever, 15 years or so, or maybe not even that, 13 years. But I have not bred animals. I've not, you know, had any business related to them. All I've done is looked at the hobby a couple of years ago and thought, well, this is kind of weird. Like, there's a lot of bad stuff happening here and no one's talking about it. So, I don't have the experience to, you know, go head to head with someone that's bred 10,000 snakes. And I, and that's probably, you know, you have way more experience than me, but the point of the show is to expose those ideas. It's not about, you know, talking to someone who has 2 million subscribers. So I think it's important to have these conversations. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, I think the, the ultimate thing, like it just, for me anyway, like it just comes back to the welfare, like thing with them. Like if you can just, 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 just do it. Like, what's literally stopping you? Like, I would much rather have, for example, like four enclosures that are like spacious, that have got the plants, blah, 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 blah. And I can enjoy the animal, like watching it doing its own thing, rather than have a wall with just tubs facing me. Yeah. Like, that, that, like, that's just me, but... And I don't know. I've definitely as soon when I've been getting like older and stuff, like I've definitely become like more like pro animal than people. But 
my my ideas and ideals like sometimes do ally with the antis. Like I can I can see where they're coming from. Yes. Like I really can. Do I want the hobby to stop? No. Of course I don't. Like I love it. Like I love the science behind it. I love learning about the animals in general. Like even sometimes like we can help protect a species. Like that type of thing. And I think that needs to be explored more um as well. Like what keepers can do to to do that. Because there are some like big names in the hobby. Like granted they're all like crusty old white men, but like do you, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, well, and I think that we need, we need we need fresh blood as well. I think that's part of how you know be, feeling like a little bit of an outsider allows us to look at the hobby from a point of view that's not you know you're not in it. And I think that's where you you see a lot of these old myths that are just being you know you ask many breeders obviously they're going to give you care guides that are just way off because they've been in it for so long. So it, from an outsider's mm. perspective, I think it's good to see the hobby that way. And and you're so right. The animal rights groups people do make good points. Not all yeah. of their points are great, and they do cherry pick. But I they, always yeah, say that like, if if we aren't doing a good enough job presenting the hobby in a way, or, or if we are presenting the hobby in a way where things can be cherry picked, it's our fault. Yeah, uh, yeah, a uh, hundred uh, percent. I mean, when it comes to like the aunties in general, anyway, like. I've been to parties and stuff before and like I've been um, there with like vegans because I'm a vegetarian, the vegans automatically attach themselves to me and then start, hey, we tried cutting out cheese. I'm just like, no, go away. But like, <laughs> anyway, like they'll attach themselves to me and I'm just they're, like talking and like they think, especially one of them, like she's a member of PETA, um, you know, the people for ethical torture, sorry, treatment of animals. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but yeah, and, and she, she was still talking to me about that. She was just like, don't you think it's really bad, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, hold on, hon, right? Just one second, right? How, first of all, how long have you been keeping? Second of all, what's your educational status on the actual topic you're discussing? Because typically you'll find that these people that have got something to say do not have the slightest background in what they're arguing against. Yeah. Like, how, how can you do that? And it's just like, you can ask them simple questions. Like, okay, so talk to me about stereotypical behaviors. And they'll, they'll just recite some jargon that they've seen. And it's like, okay, so you can understand it. This is like a level two. So now progress that, analyze it, and tell me what you think it means. And they're just, and it's, they're just like, um, um, mm -hmm. um, and it's like, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, don't you even dare dictate to me on how to care for my animals when one, you don't keep the same things as I do in general anyway. And two, you've never had the educational background to do so. Yeah. Like you went to college in hair and beauty. Well done. Like what, what more do you want? And now you've found veganism. Like, Mm, whatever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I totally agree. And, yeah, the other day I actually had somebody who seems to be very animal rights heavy on Instagram follow me on Instagram. I thought that's kind of weird, like because typically it's, I mean, animal rights people are going to stay away from people that are you know pro promoting the pet hobby. But then I was kind of looking through their stuff, and she had a ball python, and I'm not sure if it was a rescue or what the situation was, but it is one of those things where. It, you know, they can be very anti hobby. And I think this ball python may have fallen into her lap somehow. I don't even really know the story, but that sort of stuff will, will start to morph the way they think about it. It's like all of a sudden they can see a relationship with the animal and understand that they can really, you know, have a good quality of care and increase their welfare. And it's not, you don't just want to cut the hobby off at the knees and say, just get rid of it. Because if you get rid of the hobby, you don't know what falls away with it. You don't know what, you know, education goes away with it. We don't know, yep. you know, the science that we derive from the hobby, all those positive will disappear as well and the animal rights yep. people aren't aware of the positive what whatsoever and they just want to remove it and then figure out the collateral damage mm. like you were saying earlier like they have a very black and white view but like obviously for me and you like it's not it's it's extremely gray like in any aspect of life like it can literally you can pick the simplest topic and there is a good side and a bad side to it but it's it is what it is. Uh, it is what it is at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, 
I would love to see photos of your rack system with UV once you are done that project, once you kind of have that going, if you can post that on your Facebook or whatnot, I would love to to follow up with that because I think that's a really cool thing. This was a great conversation. We've gone way over time here and the time is flying by. So this is this is great. Can you let everybody know where they can find you online and kind of keep up to with what you're up to? Um, so my Instagram um, is Ash. Um, A S H T E S V uh, after the Elder Scrolls Five, because <laughs> nice. I'm I'm that much of a nerd. Uh, come on, 2011, <laughs> um, and then my Facebook is just um, Exotics of the World. Um, it's got a picture of a um, really spicy um, sarong locality green tree python, a baby one, um, on there. So awesome. yeah. But, well, I'll put that yeah. all in the I, mean, I, don't, I don't really post that much stuff, uh, in all fairness, on, on the old gram. But if you want to follow me, follow me. Yeah, I'll it put is. it in the show notes and then yeah. they can follow the, the store as well. And hopefully we can see some of those uh, projects that you're working on because it sounds great. Well, Ash, thank you yeah. so much for, for joining me today and, and hanging out at, uh, at the college for a little bit longer to, to do the conversation with me. So thank you. This was a pleasure. Yeah, no, thank you uh, ever so much. And like I said to you earlier, it was a bit surreal um, actually talking to you, but I'm a bit, I'm a bit starstruck, but yeah. <laughs> now you're a guest on the um, show. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah, thank you ever so much. Awesome. Well, Ash, that is officially done. We did it. That was great. All right, that is the end of another episode. Ash, thank you so much again for joining me. That was a great conversation. I'm happy we were able to cover quite a wide range of topics there. Of course, I'm looking forward to continuing to stay in touch and also kind of follow up on some of those projects that we talked about within the episode. Listeners, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Again, if you want to support the show, you can go buy yourself a shirt at animalsathome.ca slash shop or share the content or give a rating on the Apple podcasting app. A rating or review helps us a ton. Thank you very much to Custom Reptile Habitat com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast if you are looking for more information on them head to the show notes or the youtube description box and there is a link right there and one more reminder if you are looking for more information on this episode head to animals at home network.com you'll find the show notes for every single episode as well as links to bryce broom's podcast animals everywhere as well as our new session of roast sessions which is another podcast that we do or another sort of series that we do on this network i will catch you guys in the next episode